The security industry, like many others, is undergoing the digital revolution. What this has led to is a rapid and wide-scale adoption of digital video surveillance systems based on IP networks. Some, however, believe the wholesale adoption of software-driven IP network architectures may not be in the best interests of the consumer. Michael Newton is the CEO of Cheshire-based security firm Dedicated Micros, part of the AD group of companies. In this recent interview with CCTV Media, he explains his reservations about IP solutions and outlines what he believes is a better approach to maximising the benefits of digital technology. The IP model you know, has many persuasive benefits, getting away from the coax, better cabling infrastructure, more flexible communication techniques, the ability to send the pictures wherever they want easily. It's very easy to present those arguments, but the infrastructure and the architecture has to evolve to the extent that the cost performance and resilience of those IP solutions match existing analogue or hybrid solutions. I think the key issue now is to work out how we evolve the uh, technology to give uh, you know, delivery of that, rather than at the moment. We've had the first stage, and it's worked out uh, to be a lot more expensive than people expected, and not really delivered the value or the, or the added benefits that they were looking for. They have protected themselves against the future, potentially, but they haven't really achieved the end game yet. We're clearly going to go digital. Especially to go into high definition, there is no viable long distance analogue equivalent for, for high definition. But uh, I'm not going to subscribe to the uh, all analogue uh, video will disappear completely camp uh, because uh, when we launched the multiplexes you know, back in, uh, uh, in the mid 80s, everyone said sequential switches would disappear and you can still go out there and buy sequential switches today. The argument is always put forward that uh, you can design a network that will be resilient, uh, and a network that will uh, you know, stay operational under all circumstances, and it's certainly true that you can uh, to a large degree. But all of this does come with a cost. Uh, it's important that the architecture uh, you know, reduces the exposure to this, uh, such that it's either a denial of service attack, maybe just something as simple as the uh, central uh, DNS server or DHCP server having a bad day, or there's some error in a uh, router somewhere that uh, uh, sends bogus data out to all the routing tables in all the IP uh, uh, points on the network. Any of these things can and will bring your network down. Bearing in mind that on a pure IP so solution as well, every single camera represents a potential port into the system. To, uh, uh, you know, to have absolute confidence that each of those external end, uh, endpoints isn't a potential risk into the system is something that uh, needs more than just a sweeping statement of, oh, correct, design and uh, firewalls will protect against that. The technology itself isn't 101% you know, robust. Uh, you know, so much of it's uh, running uh, in, a, in a software-only uh, NVR environment. It's running on Windows XP. How robust is your Windows XP machine on your desk? I'm sure a week doesn't go by when it doesn't do something silly and you have have to restart and, and run it again. So these, these are the areas whereby uh, an IP-based uh, solution you know, still needs to become uh, more robust and more resilient, both in terms of the physical uh, technology being applied, but also most critically in the architecture to get away from these centralised risks. Obviously, as we move into the uh, digital environment, you have to uh, not just digitise the images, but we typically are compressing them. And again, we get into a whole uh, area of horses for courses, and uh, there is scope for using uh, very, very powerful compression techniques, but they again demand that complementary processing elsewhere in the system. There's talk about saying, well, if you use this much more powerful compression technique, you may use 10% less bandwidth, 10% less storage space which is, as a simple argument in itself, is fine. But if it then also means that you need three times as much equipment you know, you know, to achieve the same goals in terms of playback performance, review performance, you know, suddenly that storage which is getting ever cheaper, that bandwidth which is getting ever cheaper, if, you're, if you actually escalate the costs of the rest of your uh, equipment uh, you know, to achieve that, you can quickly get into a negative ROI. Obviously, in, a, uh, in an entertainment environment, in a media environment, uh, H.264 you know, is, you know, is clearly the, you know, the popular and front-running uh, format. But that's a result of you know, films and videos and media being processed several times through the, uh, through the codec to achieve all the optimizations. 
uh, you know, it's done with uh, predictive frames, backward frames, forward frames, multi-frame uh, buffers. And uh, that's why you get uh, a movie on your Sony PSP and it's a very small file and it looks very good. But someone didn't just take that movie, play it through a codec once, and magically that compressed file came out. That took a lot of effort to get it to use all of those optimizations. Now in a CCTV environment, uh, where we're uh, digitizing and then compressing that data, uh, we, we can't afford to have latency. If we're seeing someone you know, point a gun at someone now, we need to know that someone's pointing the gun at someone now, not five seconds ago, not ten seconds ago. We really need it now. So the benefits that you can gain with some codecs uh, you know, uh, in a uh, media generation environment, in an entertainment environment, and how you can apply those to CCTV, you rapidly get into a law of diminishing returns. In 1992, we had DVST. It was a seven-layer communication model. Uh, if uh, if the internet had existed, it would have been IP. Uh, but uh, that was even before the internet existed. So, in terms of sending video over uh, over a communication layer, uh, you know, it's something that we've always very much uh, been behind. But you know, whilst with both DVST and DVIP had very uh, network-capable solutions, being totally reliant on the IP system has not been our uh, our favoured route, and we've always favoured a more decentralised approach. Now, to date, that's typically been with uh, enterprise-class servers, not just servers encoding video, but servers storing, replaying the video, uh, processing metadata, integrating into your uh, wider systems, your HVAC, your building management, things of that nature. And uh, we've typically uh, taken the risk from the central point by moving that storage typically more out to the edge, uh, such that if anything impacts the central location, all your services towards the edge and all the services that are directly accessing that edge are still fully functional. As we move away uh, from an analog you know, uh, environment completely, and it becomes completely IP, the logical thing to do is to move that uh, decentralized approach uh, all the way out to the edge and actually make it each individual camera both an IP source and an enterprise class server in itself. So each of those cameras uh, can operate uh, as a complete solution by itself, uh, such that you've uh, completely now mitigated uh, uh, the risks of total system-wide failure from any single or uh, close to the central point failure. And this is, this is certainly a route that uh, we feel that we can now achieve in an acceptable price performance ratio with the advancing technology uh, for ourselves using our own uh, in-house uh, you know, chip rights technology. Uh, we've been able to achieve these performance levels in a one or two watt DSP package. Mm -hmm. so this now allows us to put that uh, software power and uh, processing power of a complete enterprise class server inside the camera as a uh, manageable uh, package, not just in terms of uh, economically manageable, but technically manageable in terms of heat processing size. And uh, this then allows us to have storage right at the camera at the edge, storage very near to the edge, such that we can have more extended storage, but also bring all those sig signals back to a central location so you still have the user experience of a completely centralized solution. But you've reduced the cost burden of uh, having the uh, whole uh, infrastructure, absolutely critical uh, path to the operation of your system. Yeah, for uh, over 10 years we've been offering IP accessibility to our products but it's had to be uh, balanced with the economic demands of the analog sources and the total system uh, infrastructure. I think to put it in perspective, uh, the leading European vendor for uh, IP solutions was delighted that I think they just uh, made their 35,000th uh, yeah, connection endpoint, which has taken, I think, the best part of you know, five years to achieve. Over that statement, in terms of both analog and hybrid solutions together, I think we've connected just over four million. Now, uh, I'm sure we've, uh, uh, we've got very good sales, but also it's got to be that there's a compelling argument why people are still using such a significant proportion of their uh, solutions on uh, hybrid-based technology. And that has to all be about return on investment. As the technology advances, the, you know, the ability to achieve both the leading edge, the, the latest technology, at an economic uh, price point, not just in terms of how, how low cost can an IP camera become, but how uh, effective can the infrastructure be to give you the same level of uh, resilience? I suspect, uh, well, our belief in fact is that uh, the ICR, the integrated camera recorder, whereby uh, it's got all the benefits of an IP environment, but uh, mitigating the significant risks and problems that have 
held back the wholesale adoption of IP, we do think that's a very important step forward. So I believe the decision uh, not by ourselves as manufacturers, but by the users, is all based about return on investment. And we do our damnedest to give the best return on investment and uh, that, that is uh, very much reflected into the technology that we offer our users.